I was just in worship um, with that awesome, awesome worship song, and um, uh, I, heard, I heard two things. The Lord says there's going to be peace like a river in this place. And then I heard thunder claps, just a clap right yeah. on top of me. I was like, Lord, Jesus, there's like cloudy with a chance of healing in Jesus' name, and really only you determine that. You determine that. Right? You can put up your umbrella and shield yourself from the healing, or you can just bask in the glory and the outpour of what God is about to pour out to you. All right? Amen. I need a big amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Woo. Okay, sorry. If we hadn't already met, my name's Rowena Rodriguez. We had a fun time yesterday, and I want to, some of you were not able to join us yesterday, so I'll give you just a quick little three-point recap. Um, so, Lord Jesus, I just thank you, Father, for peace like a river. Lord God, I ask you, Lord, for, um, for a quickening. Lord, um, you know, our feet are shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. I thank you, Lord, that we are ready to receive what you have for us, Lord, uh, by you and for us, Lord. So we praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, yesterday we had three points that we covered. Um, the significance of garments in, in, God, in God's purpose to cover you. A lot of you know um, I uh, was in the fashion uh, industry in Los Angeles, and God called me to be in Los Angeles to design clothes for people who have too many clothes. So there was no purpose in that for me once I had received the Lord. Um, I was in the marketplace, um, and uh, the Lord was ministering to me about fashion. So um, he's given me a lot of revelation. If there's a scripture about clothes in the Bible, I know where it is. Um, you know, and so, because I care about that stuff, and God does too. And this is how he cares about it. In Colossians 3, 12 to 15, New Living Translation, it says this. Since God chose you to be a holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, verse 14 says this. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds it all together in perfect harmony. See that? Not only did he choose you because you're a holy people, but you also must clothe yourself. How many of you have invited somebody to church because you're like, they're not dressed right. They need to work it out. But the word of God says you are to clothe yourself. Okay? You can invite people, like I'm a fashion designer, I've styled people, I've created clothes, I've gone, I'm a professional shopper, you know, um, and I could tell, I could tell the one, this guy over here laughing, I'm getting a kick out of this, I can take you and your wife and go shopping and do a whole extreme makeover with your wardrobe, and I can tell you what goes together, how it goes, and this is how you wear it, this is the length, this is the inseam, this is how you put it together, and if you do not put those clothes on, I can't help you. I can't help you. I can, I can tell you where to go. I can tell you what to put on. I can tell you to put on your garment of salvation, your robe of righteousness, your strength and your dignity. But if you do not put it on, clothe yourself. You're going to be inappropriately dressed. Okay? So second thing is call out to Jesus. Romans 10, 13. It says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's you. Whosoever. It didn't say the qualified ones, the religious ones, the cute little adorable ones. No, it didn't say that. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to earn it. It's whosoever. Even that messed up neighbor you have, or that person at work, or that joker cousin of yours. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Shall call. Doesn't have to be cute little pretty prayers. Just shall call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? So Matthew, we talked about yesterday, Matthew 20, about the two blind men. How they were like, shut up, shut up, shut up, be quiet, quiet, quiet. And Jesus is approaching. They're blind, so they don't know where Jesus is. But the more people will shut you up, you know Jesus is close. Right? When your naysayers start talking crazy to you, and you're like, oh, no, Jesus is close. And all they did was they shouted all the more, all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And they received their healing because they called out to the Lord, Amen. right? Mark 10, same thing. Blind, blind Bartimaeus called out. Jesus turned aside. You got to call out to Jesus. Jesus is walking by you. The presence is here. Jesus, he'll turn aside. And you're like, oh, hi, hi, Jesus. Hi. And you know what Jesus says? What can I do for you? Do you know what you're going to, what, what do you need? Do you know what you need? You know what you don't need. 
I know you don't need it not having a job. I know that you don't need a bad marriage. You don't need, you know, bad health. You don't need this crazy kid going bonkers on you. You don't need those things. But what do you want from Jesus? If he were to ask you right now, every single one of you, what do you want? Would you know what to say? Good for you. Guy okay, said yes or no. Good for just the one of you. There's somebody else? Anybody else? Okay. Just checking. Come on. <laughs> We're just talking. Y'all can talk back. Be like, woo, girl. You can just do whatever you want. Okay? All right. So, in short, Jesus will not go where he is not invited. If you got a mess and you don't go, Jesus, 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 have mercy on me, he's not going to go there. You got to know him. You don't even have to know him that well. You just got to know his name, Jesus. It's not hard. Jesus. Okay? Call out to him and strengthen your resolve. Jesus is not here to give you a handout. He's here for a face-off. He said, come to me. Right here. Right now. What do you need? Okay? You, you got that something. Some, a lot of you have got something that you want to ask for. And it's like, you can't, you, you can't even contain it. You're like, you want it so bad. Don't worry. This is your moment. All right? So I extend the challenge that we extended to you yesterday. All right? Don't just sit there in the seat that you're sitting in, hardened, and then leave here the same. Don't do that. Don't you dare do that to yourself. And for everyone that you are believing for healing, believing for restoration, believing for anointing, believing for ministries, believing for a purpose. Don't you dare do that. Sit there in your hardened state and leave here the same. He wants to change you. Change you about your situation. So call out to Jesus. That was yesterday. That's just your review. Thank you, Lord. All right. Today, we're talking about a very unusual thing. It's not fun. Not fun for me. It is now, but it is. And the Lord, um, the Lord called me, uh, and I answered. Um, it started off, actually, this is how it went. Jesus, God, if you are who you say you are, do something. Yeah. That's how it started. And then Jesus ruined my life forever. <laughs> the way that it was going, thank God he did. Right? And so, just a few months after receiving the Lord, I go to church. I'm at the Young Adult Ministry Group in Los Angeles. Everybody is beautiful. Everybody is beautiful, right? And so, everyone, I walk in and I'm thinking, wow, I've dated every 31 flavors of non believing guys. <laughs> all kinds of heathens, and I just, I know which flavors I like, which flavors I don't, the ones I stay away from, the ones I have an allergic reaction to, like, I know which flavors are the flavor, right? So I go into this church, and this young adult group, and I'm sitting on this, like, it was like on this side, on the right side of the church, and it was like in the third row, spiritual splash zone, you hear? Spiritual splash zone, there's three rows, you'll get lit, don't worry, you know? And so, so I was sitting in the spiritual splash zone, and I was like, in worship, I'm like, thank you Jesus for all the hot guys. So, I'm so excited. Like, I've dated every heathen, and now I'm a Christian, and now I'm going to be married in like a year. You know, this time, make sure I be married, you know. And then I hear the voice of the Lord sweetly and so gently say to me, No dating. And my worship leader goes, Huh? I was like, Get the behind me, Satan. You know? Right? So. So by the end of that service, I'm bawling my eyes out because I know God spoke something that was near and dear to my heart. Because I said to him in that prayer, when I, when I walked in, saw the hot guys, I was like, Lord, you can have everything except for dating. And he said, well, I want that. But, I, but you can have everything. 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 I just want this little thing. And do you know what he said? He goes, I want all of you. So that one thing in your life that you're like, Lord, you, everything is yours except for this, he's going to look at you and say, I want that. So the very thing that you withhold is the very thing he will require. Keep that in mind. If you're holding it from him, it's what exactly what he wants. All right. So out of that 
what I now lovingly refer to as my man fast. No dating looked like this. No breakfast, lunch, dinner, coffee, hot dogs, popcorn, donuts, shakes, whatever, lattes, whatever it is, none of that. No one-on-one -on -one interaction with guys that were out of the business you know, realm or the ministry realm. And there was nothing like, there's, there's, there's nothing fun. That's what I thought. I'm like, I'm gonna have a boring, what, a, what, a, what is this, you know? And uh, what I said to the Lord was, okay, I feared God so much that I didn't want to say no, but I did negotiate. I'm gonna give you two weeks. I give you two weeks, I met a couple guys at Starbucks that week, and I said, it's not gonna work out. <laughs> and then that week, I went to the Word of God, and the Word just started boy, just jump, hopping out of the page, landing right into my heart. And I was like, oh wow, this is amazing. What I realized was when I got took men out of my brain and out of my heart and out of my schedule, I had so much time, so much space, so much capacity. I didn't even know what to do with it. I had vacated this prime real estate that I didn't even know was dedicated to just you know, putting some, you know, adding some fries with my shape, trying to get the right kind of guy, and putting the right kind of makeup on, um, going to the right kind of club to attract that. Remember, I had flavor, so so I had to attract. I had, I had a perfect, I had a perfected recipe too. Some of you got recipes, you need a junk. All right, I had a perfect recipe because I knew exactly the kind of guy I like, the type, the body build, everything. And Lord was like, um, that's not gonna work. You're like, oh, okay, what you, what's your best God? And, he's, and, and his best was, you're going to be in my word. I'm like, oh, okay. So the two weeks, God is not the God of addition. He's the God of multiplication. He turned my two weeks into eight years. Some of you are like, single ones are like, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I will not pray that over you. I'm not going to anoint you to have a, a, you know, a, a, an eight-year manifest. It's kind of cruel and unusual punishment, to be honest. But you know what happened in that amount of time is the Lord revealed to me his plan and purpose for my life. As a fashion designer turned evangelist. And when I say evangelist, who am I evangelizing? I don't know. I didn't know anybody. You know, like everybody I knew was at church. And he spoke to me from Ezekiel 3, and he said, I'm not going to send you to people of unknown language. I'm going to send you to the church to evangelize the church. I'm like, that's not going to go well. Who do you think you are, fashion designer? Dressed inappropriately at a church. Who do you think you are? You know? And I was like, I don't think I'm anything, but he told me to do it. So that birth plankton project, the ministry of purity. We're a parachurch ministry, and we minister purity. We first started out with, uh, you know, women and girls. And then uh, guys were like, what about us? What about our sons? What about our purity? We care about that. I said, okay. Let me ask God what he wants to do. So now we have Plain Jane and Joe project. Okay? Right? So after eight years, no dating. You'd think that my, my life was boring, but going into ministry from, you know, working the fashion career, coming into ministry is a very full life. Right? Uh, I was a workaholic, and the Lord healed me in my workaholism. And um, at the end of the eight years, I broke my fast with... A relationship. Oh. <laughs> I broke my fast with a heartbreak. With the very first Christian relationship I had ever experienced in my whole life. I thought it was everything. All the expectations were on people in the ministry were like, watch this, watch this. She's been our man for us for eight years. Watch and see how God blesses her. Oh, hi. How are you? Here's everything. The whole world. All these promises. Said all the right things did all the right things, and then changed his mind after two months. Here's all these promises. Here's all this word of God. Here's all this prophecy. I bless you. Here's the children we're going to have. Here's the ministries we're going to have, the businesses. We're gonna, you know. I was like, oh, I love this. This is great. And he's like, oops, just kidding. You're not the one. So I had to deal with rejection, abandonment, Am I tall enough? Am I not skinny enough? Do I not know the word enough? All of those things that we think about. Not something you think that God would do after an eight-year manifest, but God is good. And you know what delivered me from that heartbreak? My pastor did an altar call. He's like, Psalm 8411 says, No good thing will I withhold from those who walk uprightly. Man. He preached it like this. If God withheld it, 
then it wasn't good. There are some relationships in your life that God withheld from you and you're like trying so hard to go get it back. And they're gone. Praise God. And you need to know if God withheld it, it wasn't good. Be redeemed of that. He'll tell you when to fight, when to cling, when to like ferociously fight for it. I mean, I wasn't married to the guy. I had no commitment to him. There wasn't anything for me to fight for. We were two months into the relationship. But God withheld it because it's not his best. I'm like, Lord, if you withheld this guy, and he was pretty good, I thought, until I figure out he wasn't. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I was like, it's a close call, y'all. <laughs> okay. And here's the crazy thing. I was like, Lord, but Proverbs 18.22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, he finds favor, and obtains favor from the Lord. I was like, Lord, you're withholding me from a guy. My husband. I need him, and he needs me. Why are you withholding him from me? And, I, and I'm thinking it's not fair. I've done the work. I did the hard work. I did the job. I sowed in tears. I sowed in loneliness and desperation. I served in a youth ministry. I love babies. I'm a godmother so many times over. I've been a bridesmaid. I'm, I can't even count. What are you? Why are you doing this to me? And he said, because I have my best in store for you. I, you have conceived a plan and purpose for your life. And I don't want a man to touch it. It's good. It's good Joseph right? adopted Mary's child. He didn't, that was not his child. That was God's conception. The Holy Spirit came upon her to conceive. So the Holy Spirit had come upon my life to conceive a plan and a purpose for this generation and for generations to come. And he said, I don't want a man to touch it. It's holy. It's important to me. It's powerful. The woman, the man that's going to come into your life is going to cover this child and adopt this child and make sure this child grows to maturity so that it can fulfill its plan and purpose on this earth for my people in this generation because this is the generation you live on. And all your children for the generations to come. Psalm 103.45 says this. Who rede he redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with loving kindness. In compassion, he satisfies your years with good times. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Some of you are like, my biological clock is... I looked... Everywhere in that book, there's a biological clock. Trust me. There's a woman that was beyond her childbearing years, and she got pregnant. And a virgin that got pregnant. Now you tell me, are there tri uh, is there a biological clock? There isn't one. He restores your youth like the eagle. You are only as old as your heart is old. Don't look at what you're looking at in the mirror, because the Lord says he's going to restore you to your youth. I know some young people who are old. Like, relax. You're so, you know, you're striving. You're, you're not free. You don't have joy. And I know people who are mature in age and they got a spring in their step. I'm like, hold on, I can't. And I'm like, man, you're working out. Oh my gosh. I can't keep up with them. Because the joy of the Lord is their strength. I can't, I can only. Pray and hope to mature to that kind of youth. To grow up to be that young. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I broke my fast. That was three years ago. Ding. No bling. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so what do I call this season? My man slow. <laughs> what do you do in a man slow? Not much. Oh, um, sorry. No, no, just kidding. Okay. So I thought, Lord, if dating isn't for me, then what is? What is for me? And I thought about it. What could I be doing in this sun, in this season, that could really position me from marriage? 
Because in Proverbs 31, it says she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. I am not married yet, and I can do my husband good all the days of my life. I am doing him good right now, standing up here. I am blessing him. The friends that I have, the clothes that I wear, the eyeshadow that I love, the lashes that I put on, that is doing my husband good all the days of my life. I haven't even met him yet, and I am doing him good. Never mind the BC part of my life. Thank you, Lord, that he covers a multitude of sins, right? He blots it out. But I am accountable to the life that I have now in Christ. And I can, I can, I can approach my husband. I can be presented to my husband by God and trust that I have honored him all the days of my life. I can say it. I can have total boldness and confidence that I have honored him. And what really inspired me and put, you know, log in a fire was uh, John Hennessy Bevere's The Story of Marriage. One of their chapters, early chapters, is called Begin with the End in Mind. So if I were to begin and position myself for marriage, we all know where we want to be at the end. 50 plus years married, children, grandchildren, blessed ministries, um, you know, blessed health, investments, things going on, inheritance, not just for our children, but for our children's ch children. We know we want to get there. What are you going to do right now to get you there? What are you going to do? Because for me, you know what I did? I have Pinterest boards <laughs> for wedding stuff. Cute little Pinterest boards. I like this, I like this, I really like this. Cake, dress, everything. That's for one day. What I realized was, ever since I was like 12 years old, I had been planning my wedding one day. I had planned my whole life for one day and didn't do a single thing. I don't have a single Pinterest board that is for a, a, a successful marriage. So the Lord said, begin with the end in mind. I said, Lord, what are we going to do now? I'm not, not, even, not even dating. I don't even date. Like, not even a coffee. By the way, that's not like a solicitation, so don't even <laughs> I said on international television, oh, I'm kind of reviewing applications, and I got all this like Facebook. I'm like, oh, weird stuff. Ooh, awkward. Um, awkward, just kidding. You know. So what I realized was, in the design of marriage, my husband is not going to be my first love. He's not. You think, oh, he's my first love. I've known him since high school. First love. Nope. Jesus is your first love. Amen. So in the design of marriage, Jesus is my first love, and my husband is my second love. And I cannot love my husband in right order unless I love the Lord first. Because if I don't have Jesus first, I will, I will expect my husband to be perfect like Jesus. And he's not going to be perfect. Come on. So I had to get that in the right order. I had to begin with the end in mind. Now, premarital counseling looks like this. I thought, well, let me start, let me look into premarital counseling. What do we have to do? Well, guess what? You're not qualified, Rowena, because you're not engaged. <laughs> well, why, why can't I do it? So I call a premarital counselor at my church, making a meeting with them. He's like, it's highly unusual, Rowena. I said, oh, by the way, Pastor, can I go through this curriculum with you, which is four weeks, 16, uh, eight sessions, um, and there's a book. And he's like, well, just charge you half because it's just one of you and there's a compatibility test. <laughs> I said, great. He's like, well, how are you going to do the compatibility test if there's no guy? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Jesus will work it out. <laughs> um, and then he's like, well, what about, you know, a friend? And I'm like, that's a bad idea. Um, I don't have guy friends because, hello, pastor, I've been on a man fast and not dating for, you know, eight plus three to do that. So, so I was like, so that's a bad idea. What about an old relationship? I'm like, that's a really bad idea, right? So then he says, well, what about Jesus? And I actually went up. I said, yeah, that's a great idea. I would love to know if I'm compatible with Jesus. <laughs> Turns out I am. If you want to see my compatibility test, it's in my purse. <laughs> I do. I was like, I'm going to look so bad in this, but it's okay because he's perfect. <laughs> so, of course, his strengths were amazing. And I was like, you need work here. You need work here. You need work here. 
but it was good for me because I needed to know. I needed to know what needed to be addressed in me before I could walk into a marriage. Because Jesus is my first love. Let's grab the notes. I'm going to give you this in two minutes. I'm starting to write my first book, and I've got a second book now, because the Lord said, I want you to prepare my bride. Prepare my bride for the soon arrival of her beloved. Okay. I've always kind of jumped around and said I'm God's, like, glorified event planner. <laughs> I retired my career six years ago, so that's what I do. I host events, and we talk about purity and sexual integrity, and now we're talking about marriage preparation. So we have Mary's coming to our events, you know, in a couple of weeks. Ia's going to be flying to Los Angeles, and she's going to be speaking at Desire for Marriage Conference. And I'm going to give you, I mean, this is like a spoiler alert for my second book. Okay, so when that comes out, you already know how it's going to end. Is that okay? I'll tell you a little secret. Okay, nobody knows this, and I'm going to share it at the Desire for Marriage Conference in a couple of weeks. Um, but you're the first group of people that I'm telling you that I actually finished my premarital counseling uh, sessions so I graduated. I'm premaritally counseled now, as of January the 2nd. I am ready to go with Jesus. With Jesus. She, he and I are ready to be married. We're betrothed. We're ready to be married. So the last part of my book that I realized was premarital, premarital counseling is healthy for our relationships, for our marriages, for ourselves. Because how many of us could attest to have at least one or two character flaws that you know before you get married you need to take care of. Anybody? How many character flaws do you know you're in the marriage you know you got you in a lot of trouble? So you are in a position to do something about that. Yeah. And what I, the Lord opened up was like, I want you to think bigger. You're going to prepare my bride. Marriage preparation between me and the Lord now that we're ready to get married. Then he said, now take it to a larger scale. Our whole lives, from the time that you were born, and born again in Jesus, our entire life on this earth is marriage preparation. It's premarital counseling. It is iron that sharpens iron. It's the renewing of the water and the washing of the water through the word. This our entire lifetime is marriage preparation to be married to the bridegroom at the wedding feast. Our whole life long, all your relationships, your marriage, the deaths and, and that you've experienced in your life, the children that you raise. The jobs you have, the, the, the anointing on your life, the, um, the careers that you choose, the ministries that you, you lay down and then you pick up. All of that is marriage preparation to sharpen your character, to prepare you for a wedding. And guess what? I'm not the bride. We are the bride. We are the bride. Collectively, we are the bride. So you can't say, oh, you're so cute. No, no, no. We are cute. <laughs> we are the bride. And that's what he is saying. Get ready. Don't delay. Takes you a year to plan like a wedding. Natural wedding. You have your entire lifetime and you don't even know if you get it tomorrow. To prepare for the wedding feast. So get ready. Get ready in Jesus' name.